that I will be reading out of uh, is 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. It says, therefore, if anyone is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creation, a new creation altogether. The old previous moral and spiritual conditions has passed away. Behold, the fresh and new has come. That's in his word tonight. That's 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Again, uh, if you're just joining us, we're in the, the scriptures of 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. And tonight, if you need a title for tonight's message, it's going to be uh, this evening, to be new, we must become engrafted in Christ. To be new, we must become engrafted in Christ. So I want to talk about, first of all, what being engrafted means and what does it really mean. Engrafted means to incorporate in a firm or permanent way, a firm or permanent way, or to implant. So let's go back to the scripture where it says, therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, in other words, therefore, if any person is firm or permanent in Christ, Firm or permanent in Christ. We're not here to play play. No, we, we're about the way of the word of God. Amen. So you are permanently and firmly engrafted in Christ. In order for us and God to be grafted together, we both have to go through a process. How many of you know that there's been a process in your life ever since you accepted Christ as your personal savior? We were going through processes when we were living in sin too, but there's a process since you accepted Christ and as your personal savior to be engrafted. Engrafted is also something they do in planting trees and plants and things like that. But tonight I'm talking about being planted in the word of God to be planted and engrafted and, and, and permanently uh, positioned with Christ tonight. So for us to be grafted in, into Christ, he had to pass through the processes of incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection to become a life-giving spirit. So Christ himself went through a process. So what makes us think that we too don't have to go through a process? Amen. So the purpose to be engrafted is to bear forth fruit that will abide. Again, we have to bear forth fruit. Again, I was talking about worship. When you're a worshiper, you know the fruit of a worshiper. You're, it doesn't take forever for you to, to, to get in the presence of God because you already live in it, because it's a lifestyle. When you have a lifestyle of something, it, you don't have to teach it to somebody. You're already being that in someone. Amen. It's already engrafted in you. Amen. So the, the, the engrafted, implanted word describes the permanent establishing of the word in our hearts by God. If anything is going to be engrafted in my heart, I want it to be the word of God. You hear people say, you know, you broke my heart or my heart's in, in, in so many places. Give your heart to Christ so your heart's not all over the place. Amen. Allow your heart to be engrafted, to be permanently uh, implanted in God on tonight. So again, the word engrafted is what we're talking about. Understand that as people and as spirits, words can be engrafted or implanted that can become or has become your permanent establishment. Words alone, the things that we speak out of our mouths, things that have been spoken to us. I'm talking about words outside of God's word. What words have you allowed to be established permanently that do not align with the word that God has spoken over or about you? Which is one of the reasons when we had fervent prayer, the Lord gave me the prayer to pray off these traumas for our adult trauma and our childhood trauma. Because there's been some actions and there's been some words that were spoken over us that God said, you can't carry that from your childhood into your adulthood. So again, what words did we permanently take on or have we lately been taking on permanently that don't align up with God's word? So during this water fast, thank you, Jesus, for the water fast. Did you want more of God so much? So that you, did you want so much of him that you pressed through whatever that process was? It could have been a mental, physical, spiritual changes in order to bear fruit, new fruit, new results that will abide. There's a process of things that you got to give up during the time of fasting that you got to press through that seem like uh, it's something that's been attached to you that need to fall off of you. 
Amen. Uh, so again, what did you press through during the time that we were on this three day fast? So this past week coming off the three day fast, we had to go through a process. Amen. Sometimes, if not most times, people don't like to give up a process or a bad habit or what can cause them not to become a new creation, but rather hold on to old and previous spiritual conditions. We can't hold on to an old thing thinking that we're going to grab onto something new. You got to let go of what's old. That's why the word of God says, press towards the mark of the higher calling. Forget those things that are from behind, that are behind you. Amen. Forget those things that are behind you. You're pressing towards the mark of the higher calling. So if you're holding on to something that's old, how do you have room in your hands to, to grab onto what is new for you? So tonight I decree that we're releasing those things of old, rather we know knowingly or unknowingly, so that we can walk into every new thing that God has for us on tonight. So again, got, now, now that we're coming out of 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, turn with me to Galatians 5 and 16. Tonight we're talking about being engrafted in Christ. You know, you've got so many things out here in, in this world that can be an influencer. You know, you've got what they call uh, social media influencers. Uh, you have all these people that have all these likes and, and all these things that are influencing us to, to persuade us to be or to, 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 to look or to feel a certain type of way. But can I tell you tonight, the best example that we could ever go by is to be engrafted by Christ. The example that Christ gave us, what we should look like, how we should respond, how we should act, how we should speak. God is that Christ has given us those examples. So again, Galatians 5 and 16, this is coming out of the King James Version. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. I'm gonna say that again. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you are spending time with God as you should, and if he is on your mind and in your heart, it leaves less room for things of the flesh to, to, to be fulfilled. Amen. So again, if we are walking in the spirit, ye shall not fulfill the lust of flesh. Paul tells us in Galatians literally to walk and keep on walking by the spirit's power and guidance. The picture Paul will plant in this scripture is about setting aside our own power and relying on God's. That's why it is essential to be filled with the Holy Spirit and his power because his power will establish you. Paul points to the only source of power and wisdom beyond ourselves tonight, the Holy Spirit of God. To be new people of God, we have to stop doing old things coupled with old mindsets and coupled with old habits and excuses. An excuse is to free oneself from accountability. No longer are we making excuses for not being accountable as believers. Um, amen. We're, we're, we got to hold ourselves accountable. Amen. For the things that we confess, the things that we do so that we can stop making excuses to keep doing the same reprobate repetitive situation in your life. It's an excuse. It's not a reason. It's an excuse for me to stay lazy. It's an excuse for me not to, to move forward. It's an excuse. Amen. The reasons may be there, but don't make it an excuse. Don't take it on as an excuse for you not to move forward in the things God has for you. The root of an excuse is fear. The root of an excuse is fear, uncertainty, uncertainty, or lack of purpose. As believers in Christ, we should lack nothing. You should lack nothing on tonight. Why would you lack anything when we serve a God who's, who owns everything? We should not lack in any way. So there's no room in the, in, in the, in, in the relationship with Christ and I for there to be an excuse. Because if he would have gave an excuse on that cross, we all would be hell bound. If he gave an excuse for why he didn't want to want to save us or deliver us or give a, or go and create a place for us after we left this earth, where would we be? We don't serve a God of excuses on tonight. So the purpose of an excuse is to protect ourselves from our fears. I have all kinds of excuses I, that, that I'm protecting myself from, from fear. You, you, you say, uh, Prophet Z, and I'm giving an example. You call to go to the nations, 
Amen. You call to go to other countries and continents, but you don't even have a passport because you're scared to fly. My God, you're making an excuse for something. Don't make excuses for what God is calling you to do. There's people that are waiting for you to show up and don't allow your excuse to keep you anchored in a place that you can't go forward. We make excuses to avoid exploring the boundaries of our comfort zone. We can get so comfortable that all we have around our zone is excuses, a block excuses. Every brick has an excuse that's keeping us in our comfort zone. We make excuses to justify when we don't commit to what we said we were going to do. We make excuses to avoid learning more about ourselves that might make us feel uncomfortable. The dangers of making excuses can be harmful, people of God, in lots of different ways, affecting both your personal growth and your mental health. And the main challenge is that excuses don't serve to push you forward. In fact, they're just a way of avoiding the truth. And tonight, we're not avoiding the truth. For the word of God says that in his word shall lead you to all truth. So anything that, that is opposite of what God's word is saying to you, it will not help you get to where you need to be. Hear what I'm saying to you. Excuses are nothing but that's rooted in fear. Amen? Do not be afraid to move forward. Stop with the excuses. I'm thankful that I don't, desert, I, I don't serve a God of excuses but a God who exemplifies virtue and goodness. Just because it starts with EX is not the same word. Excuses. He's not a God of excuses. He's a God that exemplifies virtue. He's a God that exemplify, exemplifies love and grace and mercy and humility for each and every one of us. In order to be grafted, to, in order to be engrafted, you can't make excuses. You can't, we don't, we're not making excuses or we, we would, you know, look, we don't make excuses when we were people we ought not be with. We're not making excuses when we go places we ought not be. We're not making, we're not making excuses when it, we could go on and on and on. So why do we want to give God, don't give God what you give the world. Amen. Give God your very best. Everything that you do, you do it unto him. You do it as if he's standing right there in the room watching you. Everything that we do, God sees us. The good, the bad, the ugly. He even sees when we spend time with him. He sees when we don't spend time with him. So in order to be engrafted, you can't make excuses. Excuses don't work with God. Amen? Excuses don't work with God. So as believers, don't allow excuses from others to work with you either. Amen? Hallelujah to your name, especially when you know that greater is upon a person's life. Don't allow the excuses. It's time. It's time to excuse yourself from excuses. Amen. It's time to excuse yourself from excuses. If you're making any excuses or if you know anybody that does, tell them it's time for you to excuse yourself from your excuses. How can you become new each day holding on to the same expected excuse to keep you in lack? How can, how can you, or where your light, where God is wanting you to blossom and bloom. He wants you to blossom and bloom tonight, people of God. Whenever we start making excuses for not doing what God has directed us to do, it can go from bad to worse. In fact, usually if we're not careful, our excuses can eventually lead us into sin. Amen. You have excused yourself so much. You excused yourself right into sin. We start saying things like, well, no one is perfect. <laughs> no one is perfect. God, this is my favorite one. God knows my heart. And that's, <laughs> and, that, and that's really all that's important. Amen. Then, and then not only that, don't, don't, don't give an excuse that can keep you from really living in the best life God has for you. That's what Joyce Meyer said. And then finally, this is what Cam Newton said. He says, I hate excuses. Excuses are a disease. Cam Newton said that one. I just thought I'd throw that in there. That ain't the word of God, but just what people that, that you know, that, that do things that are doing great, that did great in the things that they were called to do. You can't have an excuse to be great. You can't have an excuse to get all the greatness that God has for you and to be engrafted in him. So if we're truthfully, we will admit that we've all been guilty of making excuses. I know I have. For some reason or another, when it comes to our relationship with God, we make excuses for not praying, not studying, not going to church, and basically not dedicating ourselves to God in a manner that he requires. 
But the reason excuses don't work with God is because he knows the truth. How can we give God an excuse when he already knows the truth? There's no need to try to blame others for our shortcomings. Just get it together. Amen. Understanding that God does not accept excuses. Why should he accept excuses from us when he has the best for us? Amen. Don't allow your excuse to eliminate you from getting everything that God has called you to walk in and to have. God will place a conviction on us and all the excuses that we come up with because he's already given us power to do whatever he commands. If God tells us to do something, he expects us to get it done and forget about our excuses. So again, I'm gonna put a pin right there. If God is calling us to do something, why would we make an excuse when we call on him and we want him to show up? God, I thank you tonight for not making excuses for not blessing me. God, I thank you tonight for not making excuses for saving me. God, I thank, I thank him tonight for not being a God of excuses. God made all things new for us after Jesus' death. And that is such good news. That is good news to celebrate about. Who doesn't love a new beginning? Who doesn't love a new beginning? So often when I look back on my life and see the, the many new blessings and the new beginnings that God has given me, and it moves me to joy. Some of you need to take a moment, just, just a second right now to look, just take a look back. When I say don't look at the past, I'm talking about look back from where God brought you from up until where you are right now. And just think about how it should move you into joy because he moved you out of some situations. He moved you out of some relationships. He moved you out of some, some, some areas, some territories you didn't need to be in. To appreciate what God has done for us, we must understand what we were delivered from. Again, I know I tell jokes, but I tell this joke that says the reason people don't get delivered is because they don't want to be. If we repent, that means we're going to repeat it. I'm repenting, God, that I lied today, but I ain't asking you to deliver me from being a liar. <laughs> when you get delivered, it, it, it leaves you. Amen. It, it leaves you. So again, tonight, we have to understand where God has brought us from and delivered us from. Excuses versus expectancy. That's what we're going to talk about briefly tonight. So I'm going to talk about myself. Uh, I believe Prophet Sunshine, when she uh, taught, she said, you got to make it personal. So I'm going to make it personal tonight, people of God, uh, and along with uh, God's word coupled with it. Um, when I take a self inventory of my life and I reflect on excuses I made versus what was expected from God, I saw that excuses robbed me of the productivity and the quality of my life. God had for me, what God had for me, it robbed me because I made excuses. It also made it harder for me to see my own rule, role in my uh, successes and failures. I say this often and I mean it each time that I say this because we serve a God who is healer. I no longer wanted to be sick of self handicapping and blame shifting. So I got sick and tired of being sick and tired, amen? of the excuses. It's going to get to a place in your life when you get sick and tired of certain things, like you know that something's better for you. And I got sick and tired of things happening in my life that I saw and felt that were handicapping me as well and blame shifting. Amen. So that was with excuses. Now with expectancy from God, that's when the engrafting took shape. I began to be engrafted in God in a, in such a way uh, that I took shape and form. I incorporated his word even more. Expectation in God gave me confidence, more confidence in areas. It gave me courage and deep conviction that nothing will stop me from accomplishing God's plans for my life. That's after I had to flip the page from excuses and get to expectancy and getting engrafted in Christ. A heart of expectation believes that with God, all things are possible. That's in Matthew 19 and 26. It's never ashamed, it's, it's never ashamed of the gospel of Christ. That's in Romans 1 and 16. So examples of my excuses along my walk in my life. So let me say this. I made this excuse during my earlier years, my younger years. I would say, you know, I'm young. I have a high metabolism. I don't have to work out as much. I just didn't like working out. I made excuses. 
Oh, you know, I got a high metabolism. Yeah, that was that was several years ago. Amen. Uh, I really didn't feel well at times, just being tired of working for other people. So I call in sick. I wasn't lying. I might not have been physically sick, but I was sick of that job. Amen. So I call in making excuses. Some of y'all been there. Amen. Now I'm, I'm talking about having a cold or the flu. I'm talking about, I'm just sick. I don't feel like going in today. So I'm calling in, making excuses, knowing I need to be there. Yeah. I had a couple of vacation days. I could have, I didn't miss no money, but I thank God. You know, I didn't want to be there. Just excuses. I don't want to go, you know? So anyway, so making excuses, not finding out all the details of what could work for me, uh, talking to people doing well in certain industries, but most were about self gain. So in other words, I was making excuses to not go further to find out for myself instead of just taking uh, somebody else at their word because people only want to give you enough because if they think they give you too much, you may take it and run with it and do better than them. My God. So I had to stop making excuses, waiting on people that were doing better in an area or a field that I was doing, thinking that they were going to really help me. I had to go get it for myself. So no more excuses with that. Amen. So uh, what was some, what was some other excuses I did? I had to do better. I had to move forward. That's just a couple of excuses that I used to do, people of God. Amen. But now, examples of expectancy. Knowing and expecting Christ, accepting Christ as my Savior when I was 14 years young. Uh, but then in my adult life, understanding who I truly am in God, my purpose in him, uh, being introduced into the apostolic prophetic kingdom and understanding, being prophesied to by true prophets, people who truly heard God's voice, God uh, and God telling them, you know, I was born to lead, prophetic words like that, prophetic, prophetic words like you have a sword in your belly. Uh, every time you open your mouth to sing, even if it's the ABC song, God has anointed your voice for healing. These are prophetic words that that I remember being taught, taught spoken to me. Uh, you were called to be uh, a prophetic psalmist. There are scrolls of music in your belly, which are heavenly prophetic songs. You walk in deliverance and healing anointing. Um, out of everything that you've been through and that I brought you out of, why would you not think I would not bring you out of this too? That's what God spoke to me. So things like this, I started expecting things from God and he started speaking more to me and I could hear him more vividly, not just for myself, but through others. He would send message through messengers to give me his word. Um, as I began to have expectancy. So church mother Zelma is more than one character. That was another prophetic word that was prophesied to me. Um, at the comedy shows, God will or, uh, orchestrate for souls to be saved and deliverance. Like we will open up uh, a, a place for people to be able to receive Christ at the church mother uh, comedy. Uh, you were made for more than what this world is telling you and trying to offer to you. That one was not, your husband, things like that. Things I'm telling you, I'm being, I'm being told. I mean, God just hit me in the throat when I started <laughs> literally expecting things from him and I shifted from excuses to expectancy. He doesn't even, God, God was saying, yeah, that was not your husband. He doesn't even have my heart. My God, uh, hello. You stepped out on faith 24 years ago into a one bedroom apartment. And for six years, I took care of you. This is what God is telling me when I had expectancies. This is what he did. This is what God did for me, people of God. In 2020, I moved to Huntersville. 24 years ago, I moved up here. He said, I did, you were never late on your rent. You weren't missing any meals. And it said it was during those times I was reshaping you, growing you. These are during my times, one of my seasons of expectancy from God when I stopped making excuses. One of my, one of my many... Uh, and I, and I have notes and I'm going to say this. One of my many uh, come to Jesus moments was when I repented and asked God to deliver me from me and to hide me so that if someone was the one that was for me, let them be the only one that can find me. Let him be the only one that can see me. Apostle Edmund C. Brown talked last week, did an awesome job on talking about fasting. He says that when he when he has uh, women conferences and they talk about being single, he says, if you want to be found, get lost. He said, tell a lady, get lost. And the women are like, what you talking about, get lost? Where God said, it, it, they have to find you. He has to find you, amen? So hide me, oh God. And so I asked the Lord to hide me from what wasn't for me. Let the one that is for me 
to only be the one that can see me because I was done in that area of my life of excuses. Again, you already said that these frogs wasn't the prince. You said they didn't even have your heart. Amen, God. And I wanted a man that had God's heart. Amen. Even if he wasn't a, a Bible toting, scripture quoting, but he knew God. If he didn't, God, just let him know you. Let him have a heart for you. Let him have a fear for you. You know, you got people out here, men and women, young girls, young men out here, they, 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 they don't have a fear for God. Just doing everything, you know, fearlessly and with, without any repercussion. I don't want somebody to have the fear of God in their heart. So God, God heard my prayer. These are times doing expectancy. I was expecting something from God. So I said, Lord, I don't want nobody else at the time. My, my, my little one bed, my one bedroom apartment wasn't little. It was little, but you know, people always want to put little on something. Is that your little car? Is that your little job? Is that your little house? No, that was my apartment. Amen. Amen. That was my apartment. It was huge to me because God gave it to me. Amen. Don't you minimize what God does for you and don't you let nobody else put their mouth on the stuff that God blessed you with. Amen. That's just a side note. Amen. So again, I said, God, I don't want nobody else being around me, coming through my house, whatever, if, if, if other than my dad and my brother at the time that were living. I said, and the next person that come through this door, God, let him be my husband. Sure enough, my dad and my mom came up there because I had to get my wisdom teeth, uh, wisdom teeth pulled and they took me up there. My dad said he was going to push me out of the car because I was, I was high on the drug. I said, that's the kind of daddy I had. <laughs> he said, Doc, look at her. Let's put her out on the side of the road. They came up to my apartment. So my dad came through. Then my brother and his wife at the time, they came up to see me. So my dad and my brother both came to my apartment. I said, all right, God, now I know what I said to you. Lord, I know what I said to you. So then that third brother that came through the house was Apostle Marvin Richardson. Amen. So God knew what he was doing. Amen. So when we speak a thing, sometimes I didn't know I was a prophet. I just know I could see things. I knew I saw things a certain way. But to be taught that, to be taught that and being a part of an apostolic ministry, people of God, understand how things operate. We're not soothsayers. We're not fortune tellers. We are people that speak the word of God. Amen. On tonight. So again, God answered all those things. I'm going to move forward. This was during the expectancy. I started uh, before I met Apostle Marvin. I started taking myself and, and, and God's word out on a date. That's right. I'd go in restaurants and I'd sit and eat by myself. And I took this book with me that I had. It was called Saved, Single, Sassy, and Satisfied by this Christian author named Michelle McKinney Hammond. And I read that book and I and I, and I, and I applied it to my life. And, and I was doing some things. God was uh, reshaping me, reforming me, getting all the gunk and all the old things away from me because I came with an expectation. No more excuses. No more excuses staying on this job when God called me to be the job. No more staying this person ain't even got a heart for you, Lord God. And God, you got so many things you're calling me to be. So I used to do those things. I started doing those things and just walking in the things that God called me to walk in. I go to Subway. I go to the park. I go up here to the lake. I was just hanging out with me, myself, and Jesus. Amen. Just getting to know me all over again and who God called me to be. Um, and it wasn't until after those few months, you know, God, God allowed those things to happen in my life. And Apostle Marvin did come and visit me. And I'm saying God answered my prayer. So this evening, with all that being said, people of God, that was during my time of expectancy. This evening, you may not be as engrafted or incorporated in a firm or permanent way in Christ to experience new results as you want. But tonight I decree and declare that you will be tonight. That you will be so engrafted in him that when God shows up, all he can see is his own reflection within you. Amen. He, I, he's the potter. I'm the clay. We're the pot. He, we're the clay. God is shaping us, making us and molding us. So no more excuses, no more excuses over our lives. And there's scriptures in the Bible that I want to share with each and every one of you before we get off the zoom tonight about being engrafted. James one and 22. It says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We're not just going to hear the word and not do the word because we're not going to be in deception. We're not going to deceive ourselves. John 3 and 5 says, uh, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And then here we are just coming off a of water fast. Second Peter 3 and 18 
but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Then the last one is 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. I said that tonight. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. In conclusion, when we are grafted in him, we now share the same life and grow with the tree we were grafted into, which is Christ. It means God's life is now in us and we can daily grow into him.